Well, as I mentioned yesterday, attorneys representing representing former President Donald Trump requested that the U.S. Supreme Court overturn the recent Colorado court decision to remove him from the state's Republican primary ballot. The left's use of lawfare to target candidates they fear at the ballot box isn't limited to the former president. Earlier this week, a Pennsylvania activist filed a lawsuit aiming to bar Pennsylvania Congressman Scott Perry from running for a seventh term to Congress, claiming he engaged in insurrection by challenging the 2020 election results. The question is, was our republic designed to withstand these types of lawfare tactics that the left is now engaged in? Joining me now to discuss this is Samantha Dravis. She's the former general counsel of the Republican Attorneys General Association, is now the principal of Axe Advocacy. Samantha, welcome to Washington Watch. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for having me, Tony. It's great to be here. So let me you've been involved in 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 in, in these issues and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but neither Congressman Perry uh, nor the president have been charged or convicted with crimes. Well, that's absolutely right. And, you know, if you want to talk about the 14th Amendment, there's another provision of the 14th Amendment called the Due Process Clause. And President Trump and Congressman Perry are absolutely being denied due process when you unilaterally have a rogue partisan official removing them from the ballot without having even been so much as charged or convicted for the crime of insurrection using a 155 year old provision that was written after the civil war and was meant to address an actual insurrection um, in which people actually took up arms against the united states so these are very thin patently absurd legal theories and Tony, I think we're in very dangerous, uncharted territory. You know, the Democrats have decided that they'll use any means necessary to stop President Trump from beating Joe Biden. They're seeing that Joe Biden has historically low approval numbers, and they're willing to misinterpret our own U.S. Constitution, erode the rule of law, which is one of the bedrock principles of our democracy, and weaponize and abuse the justice system. And so was our was our democracy built to withstand that? I guess we'll see, um, because we are in completely uncharted territory here. That's my concern, Samantha. I mean, look, first off, I, I, I'm not going to I'm not going to accept their terminology. I do not think what happened at the Capitol on January the sixth was an insurrection. I think it was a it was a lawless act. It was a riot. I, I'm against it. I spoke out about it right after it happened. I think it was foolish for people to go there and do what they did, those who broke the law. But it was not an insurrection. You don't have an insurrection with signs and and placards. That's not how you do it. Um, but then secondly, my understanding of the Constitution requires that if you have committed this crime of insurrection, you, you, you have to have been convicted of it. And neither of these individuals have been convicted of that crime. In fact, the president... Yeah, he was impeached, but he was acquitted of that. Well, that's exactly right. So Congress, there is a specific statute, 28 U.S.C. 2383, that deals with the crime of insurrection. And neither President Trump nor Congressman Perry have been charged, let alone convicted under that statute. But this is one of the key um, legal arguments that President Trump's legal team and as well as the Colorado Republican Party are arguing in their petition for a writ of certiorari to the Supreme Court is that Section 3 of the 14th Amendment um, has to have an enforcement mechanism and that that enforcement mechanism can only come from Congress alone. It's not coming from, you know, it's not whoever a random Colorado Secretary of State or Maine Secretary of State interpreting that, that Congress has to specifically lay out um, you know what they what they mean when they say who should be disqualified, and so that that will be one of the key legal arguments that I expect the Supreme Court will take up. You've got something like 15 states that are considering removing President Trump from the ballot, and so this is a key constitutional question that I hope the court will weigh in on very quickly. Yeah, I, I think you're right because I I do think that if other states follow suit that you're going to see a tit for tat. I think you're going to see Republican officials are going to look at, you know, you've got a Biden administration that's not enforcing the law at the southern border. Uh, they could act on their own, just as Colorado has acted on its own. So let's talk a little bit, Samantha, about the Supreme Court, the president, uh, his legal team appealing to the Supreme Court yesterday. What do you think the time frame may be on this and how would this play out? 
Right. So um, President Trump's appeal, I believe that was yesterday. And so the under the writ of certiorari, the other side, so the Colorado um, Secretary of State, State of Colorado, will have 30 days to respond to that petition and to argue to the court that they should or should not grant this grant cert. Um, so they'll have 30 days to do that. The court meets every Friday that they are in session and they discuss the pending uh, cases before them. And it takes four of the nine justices to grant cert. So again, I mean, I, I think I heard uh, Mike Davis say it recently, he wants the court to put on their big boy pants and do this expeditiously and swiftly. You know, they don't have to grant cert, but I expect that given what an important constitutional question this is, as well as the high number of states that are considering this and the fact that you may have a patchwork, that they will take it up and hopefully do so swiftly. Now, both Colorado and Maine sort of tried to, to play a little trick, which is they said, we're going to stay this decision until this appeal can be heard. And I believe that was meant to send a signal to the Supreme Court to say, well, you know, judicial relief isn't needed right away. Don't worry. His name's not going to technically be removed um, until the appeal can be heard. But I, you know, I think that that's just all playing politics because as we talked about from the beginning, the erosion of the principles of the rule of law here uh, the damage has already been done on that front. Correct. I, I believe you're absolutely right. And but we're we're working with a very narrow window because you know you you've got states. I mean, we're just a couple of weeks away from Iowa's caucus, and then we start rolling in March. We've got a lot of states that have their primary. So there's not a lot of time for the Supreme Court to to move on this. If they're going to step in, it's going to have to be pretty soon. That's right. Um, and I do expect, again, I, I expect that they will, um, you know, we'll see if um, the state of Colorado responds to the petition. Now, uh, one of the other factors here is that if uh, President Trump's name ends up being removed from the ballot in this process before the court could hear this case, there is an option for these state parties to decide they want to move to a caucus system. Right. Um, you know, that, that remains to be seen if that plays out. But for now, you know, both of these states have said, well, his name is technically still going to be on the ballot until the court can hear this case. Now, that works for the primaries, but it would be a different issue come the general election. Uh, the parties uh, do not have as much flexibility on how they handle the general election because that's uh, usually state legislatures. Well, that's correct. And that's why this is so important. And it's really important that we get this sort of resolved quickly because the denial of the right of the American people to be the ones to elect their representatives and their uh, president. You know, we've got millions and millions of people in Colorado alone who voted for President Trump right. and they should be the ones to decide who will represent them. They know what's best for them. And so that right belongs to them, not to these partisan officials who are just really afraid of uh, frankly, Trump beating Biden coming over. Samantha, I want to thank you for uh, joining us. Uh, appreciate your insights, and I would agree with you. I think this is very dangerous. Uh, I'm, I, I, I think our republic could, could withstand this, but the problem is it's weakened by it, and it's kind of like once you go down this path, there's, there's no going back. Samantha, thanks so much. Great to see you.